Alexis was in a hurry to get home. She literally left for half an hour to buy medicine for her little son, Bobby. She stood in line for a long time, waiting for the pharmacist to sell all the necessary medicine to the elderly lady. Finally, Alexis managed to buy the needed remedy and ran home. Besides her 10-month-old Bobby, she had two other children. She was considered a mother of many children and received a certain amount of financial support from the state, but it was still not enough. Her eldest son, Paul, who had just turned nine, was looking after the children at home. The boy behaved bravely and helped his mother as much as he could. He changed diapers, fed his younger brother, put him to sleep and sang lullabies to him. In addition to all her chores, Alexis had to go to her shift today. She worked as an ordinary at a local hospital. Her whole family depended on her. Her husband, Lawrence, died three months ago. He was hit by a car when he was crossing the road. Alexis was devastated, left alone with three children. But soon she pulled herself together and continued to live. She did not dare to leave the children with the neighbours, mostly alcoholics or shady people who only asked her for money for drinking or complained about their worthless lives. Alexis tried to reason with them and explain that she had plenty of problems too, that these marginal personalities did not even realise how they were sinking to the bottom. These were the characters Alexis had to live next door to. However, she got used to them and taught her children to stay away from them. Rushing to get back home, Alexis did not notice that she was trying to cross the road in the wrong place. At some point, she almost had the same fate as her husband, but at the last moment, someone grabbed her by the sleeve of her coat. She turned around and saw an elderly woman in a shabby and torn clothes. It was obvious that she was a beggar. She appeared out of nowhere and literally pulled Alexis back onto the sidewalk at the last moment. A little more, and the mother of many children would have been hit by a car. Just at that moment, a car whizzed by at full speed. The driver did not even think of slowing down. Although he understood perfectly that he was in the city, not on a high-speed highway. Exhaling, Alexis guiltily lowered her head. The woman who saved her appeared around 60 years old. The stranger adjusted her scarf and looked at Alexis with a heavy gaze. Why are you running so fast, dear? Do you want to get to the other world with such haste? She asked with a reproach look. Blushing from surprise and perhaps from shame for her rash intention, Alexis quietly replied, No, I was just rushing home to deliver medicine. My youngest child got sick, and I have three of them in total. There's no one to take care of them properly. Only my eldest son helps, and he's just nine years old. The beggar shook her head and offered Alexis a seat on the bench near the bus stop for a minute. Unlike most homeless people, she didn't emanate any unpleasant smell, and Alexis noticed that she seemed to be taking care of herself. Her nails were clean, and her teeth were in place. It seemed like she had accidentally become homeless. The woman expressed sympathy for Alexis's difficult family situation and offered her help. Dear, maybe I can help you. Are you serious? Alexis asked, frowning her thick eyebrows. Of course I am. I love kids. She replied with a smile on her face. By the way, my name is Karen. I'm glad to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I simply don't think... Alexis started, but Karen interrupted her. Don't look at my poor clothes. It's a separate story. I'll tell you some day. And don't be afraid of me. I won't steal anything from you or hurt your kids. However, Alexis still had reasonable doubts about this woman, since she had never seen her before and didn't even know what she really did. Alexis was perplexed and didn't know whether to accept Karen's offer or refuse it. A stranger was in front of her, but at the same time, her elderly eyes radiated only with kindness. Alexis saw a sea of possibility in them, 
as if the closest, dearest person was looking at her. Thoughts kept swirling in her head. What if she agreed? Wouldn't there be a catch? At the same time, Alexis was in a hopeless situation. There really was no one to take care of her children. Even her friend couldn't help her. She called her once and asked her to look after the kids, but she replied that she had a date with a man. After weighing the pros and cons, Alexis agreed to Karen's proposal. She had no other choice. She needed to be at work that day. Twenty minutes later, they arrived at Alexis's neat apartment, which showed the owner's industriousness. Karen looked around and said, It's a cozy and warm place. We try our best, Alexis shrugged. Come on in, let's have some tea. The children came out of the room when they heard the noise in the hallway. They immediately started asking, Who are you? Ah, Granny. Tears welled up in Karen's eyes. She took out a handkerchief from her pocket and wiped her face. Seeing her agitation, Alexis jokingly replied to the children, Yes, this is Grandma, but just for an hour. The children didn't understand what for an hour meant, but the most important thing was that they heard Grandma. They immediately smiled and started hugging the elderly woman. She almost cried again from surprise, but managed to hold back. Then little Bobby took his medicine and soon felt a little better. Alexis took his temperature just in case, and it turned out not to be critical. After giving Karen some tea, she started getting ready for work and gave her some instructions. If Bobby's temperature rises again, give him fever-reducing syrup. Okay, I got it. You don't have to worry about anything, she nodded. I'll do everything as needed. All the medicines are on the shelf in the cabinet. Alexis continued to explain and pointed to the glass cabinet. If you want to eat something, there's soup and meatballs with pasta in the fridge. There's also formula on the table in the kitchen. Paul knows he'll show you. Everything will be fine. I didn't come here for the food. Karen tried to calm her down. You can go to work and don't worry about anything. Alexis nodded, but in her thoughts, she said, How can I not worry? These are my children. However, Alexis's intuition told her that there was nothing to worry about, and Karen was incapable of causing harm to anyone. With this in mind, Alexis went to work with confidence, knowing that everything would be fine at home. As she walked to the hospital, troubling thoughts about her difficult life after her husband's death lingered in her mind. Alexis had a hard time with no one to turn to for help. Among her acquaintances, there were no people who could provide meaningful support. She often found herself in dead-end situations and had to find a way out on her own. Alexis couldn't even imagine what would happen if she gave up. Most likely, life's problems would have crushed her and her children would be sent to the orphanage. However, Alexis managed to avoid all of this, mostly thanks to her dead husband, Lawrence, who, although an orphan, knew how to find a way out of any situation. She remembered how they urgently needed to pay for their eldest son's treatment. Alexis called all her acquaintances, but was unable to gather the required amount. Her husband then made a deal with the neighbor to help him finish his summer house. In the end, Lawrence earned money for medicine, going beyond himself for his child. Alexis remembered this. Now, when she had to think about who would take care of the children, she put aside her principles and worries. Her parents had long since become alcoholics, and expecting help from them was pointless. But even in the past, when they were still leading a sober lifestyle, her mother told her right away, you got married, which means you grew up, so figure it out yourself and don't bother us. How could she hope for any help after that? With these heavy thoughts, Alexis was hurried to work, but no matter how fast she walked, she still arrived late. In the reception room, Dr. Whittaker met her with a stern gaze. 
That's a shame. Where have you been? If this happens again, I'll fire you or take away your bonuses. Alexis almost cried in response. I'm sorry, Dr. Whitaker, it won't happen again. Bowing almost to his feet, Alexis scurried to her locker. Her partner, Julia, who just a couple of months ago came to work here, was already changing her clothes. Seeing Alexis panting, she asked with a smile, Hi, why are you breathing so heavily? Were wolves chasing you or something? If only, Alexis shook her head. I was running to work, hoping to make it on time, but ended up being late. As luck would have it, Dr. Whitaker was in the reception room, and he gave me a hard time, threatening to fire me if I was late again. This one might, Julia said sadly. Listen, I keep forgetting to ask you, who do you leave the children with when you go to work? We're usually with Paul, my oldest son, Alexis replied, but today a woman is helping me. I met her accidentally on the street. She looked like a beggar, but she saved me from death. I wanted to cross the road in an improper place, where we usually run, and I almost got hit by a car. What a gift from fate! And what, after that, did you invite her to your house? Yes, well, we agreed that she would take care of the children tonight. Karen seemed like an honest woman. I haven't seen her documents, but she looks around sixty. I don't think people are capable of anything bad at that age. Oh, you naive thing! Julia shook her head reproachfully. Are you really leaving your children with just anyone? She probably already robbed your apartment, and the kids are running around hungry and calling for their mum. No, she won't do that. Alexis shook her head negatively. Okay, as you wish. Let's go to work. Otherwise, Dr. Whittaker will really fire us all. In principle, they had nothing to fear about being fired, as being a hospital orderly took all their strength and nerves. They didn't get paid much for it, and there weren't many people in the city who wanted to take care of sick people, but there wasn't much to choose from, so they had to work where they could at least get paid steadily. While Julia began to wash the floors in the hallway, Alexis went to the wards to turn over the bedridden and change bedpans. She continued to think about her children. Her colleagues' doubts about Karen had lodged in her head like a splinter. Alexis began to worry that something might have really happened to them. At some point, she even suspected that her friend might be right. At the same time, her intuition told her that her worries were in vain, and she was just winding herself up, creating more emotional problems. Not noticing someone's abandoned slippers near one of the beds, she almost tripped over them. She managed to keep her balance, but the bedpan fell loudly to the floor. The elderly woman lying in the adjacent bed grumbled and called for the doctor. After a few minutes, Dr. Whittaker arrived and asked, What happened? Why the noise? Get your orderly under control. She won't let me rest, muttered the old woman. What happened, Alexis? The doctor asked sternly. I just didn't notice someone's slippers and almost fell. The bedpan slipped from my hands, causing noise in the whole ward. She tried to explain. Okay, I'm giving you a warning. Keep working. The doctor wagged his finger at Alexis and left the ward. The incident was over, but Alexis felt a bitter taste in her mouth. She was scolded for simply doing her job properly. Once again, Alexis realised that being an orderly was a thankless job. As she left the ward, she leaned against the wall and quietly cried. Julia was washing the floor when she saw her in this state. What happened? Who hurt you? As usual, I got caught in the crossfire. Alexis replied through tears and told her colleague just what had happened in the ward. No conscience at all. They could at least say thank you. Julia shook her head. On the other hand, at their age it's quite expected, and some of them aren't even happy to have lived that long. You're right, Alexis agreed, feeling a little calmer. Sometimes I imagine myself old, and it almost makes me feel sorry for them. It's really hard for them, 
and we just can't understand them. The conversation about the incident in the ward ended when Dr. Whittaker appeared and stared at them intently. Julia moved on to wash the floors, and Alexis continued her rounds. It turned out that he sympathised with Alexis, and even tried to court her. But he had children and a wife, and he dreamed of making Alexis his mistress. Alexis knew about this, and rejected his advances in every way possible. She had no intention of becoming a kept woman, or having anything to do with such an unbalanced and, most importantly, married man. It was hard to expect anything good from him. Dr. Whittaker was angry because he couldn't understand why Alexis resisted him. He offered her his love and gifts, promising to make her a queen. "'I'll do everything for you,' he would say when they were alone. "'No, thanks. I'd rather be alone than with you.' She would shake her head in refusal. By saying this, Alexis had only encouraged the man, but she could not even think of associating with a married man. After finishing their rounds, she joined Julia, and together they quickly cleaned all the floors. Then they returned to their room. I advise you not to pay attention to Dr. Whittaker, Julia said, turning on the kettle. If you mean his threats, then I've already forgotten about everything. Alexis waved her hand. Let's eat some more fresh gingerbread. They haven't gone stale yet. Slowly carrying out their work, Alexis didn't even notice that the end of the shift was approaching. She looked at the clock and muttered to herself, Another workday has passed. Did you say something, Alexis? Dr. Whittaker unexpectedly came up behind her. Yes, I'm glad that everything is in order with the patients, Alexis confidently and without hesitation replied. Of course, they are under my observation, the man proudly said. Alexis didn't say anything, just nodded her head. She barely had the strength not to laugh. It seemed that he was trying to prove to everyone that he was the best doctor. Having waited for the end of the shift, Alexis quickly changed clothes and rushed home. While running, she worried about how the children spent the day. She hoped that if Paul never called her, then everything was all right. Entering the apartment, she smelled pancakes. The children immediately came out of their rooms. They looked full and clean. It seemed that the guest had already fed and bathed them. Alexis was shocked to see this. You're a real magician, Karen. Paul carried the younger Bobby in his arms and proudly said, Mum, he's feeling better. He doesn't have a fever any more. Alexis placed her hand on his forehead and was surprised to find that it was no longer hot. I made him a herb compress. The syrup was helpful, but traditional medicine was even better. The elderly woman responded. I don't even know what to say, Alexis said bewildered. I thought there would be clutter and filth. Is that what you wanted to say? Karen asked. Well, not entirely like that, but something similar. Alexis nodded. But now I look around and can't believe my eyes. Don't be surprised. I promised that everything would be fine, Karen said, bowing her head. Sit at the table and try it. The children have already eaten, but if they want more, there's enough for everyone. Alexis couldn't hold back her tears and hugged Karen. You're my guardian angel. These words were like balm to Karen's soul. After calming down, the women sat down at the table to drink tea with pancakes. They were so delicious that Alexis didn't even notice how she ate five in a couple of minutes. After satisfying her hunger, she cautiously asked, Excuse me for asking, but how did you end up in such a situation? You know, Alexis, I don't really have anything to tell you, Karen replied. I barely remember anything. I woke up in some ditch without documents or money. That was six months ago. There was a wound on my head. I could hardly stand up. What a horror! 
and there was no one around? Alexis asked, putting her hands to her face in sympathy. Why not? Karen shrugged. Some vagrants picked me up and took me to their shack. They gave me clothes because mine were no good. Who knows how long I had to lie in that ditch. So I put on what they gave me. There was no other choice anyway. I don't even remember how it all happened. Did you try going to the police? Alexis continued to ask. Are you kidding? Karen replied with annoyance. I went there, explained my situation, and they didn't even take a statement. I don't understand. Did they stop protecting people here? Alexis was surprised. There was a local police officer who told me that I was getting in the way of helping decent people. Tell me, Alexis, am I an indecent person and unworthy of respect? The elderly woman burst into tears, and Alexis handed her a handkerchief. No, it's not true. You're a good person, she reassured Karen. You just happened to meet a heartless police officer. Maybe. That's why I left without getting any help. The woman shook her head. I feel sorry for you. You were just a victim of circumstance, and as for the police, there's always a rusty bolt in the mechanism. Deep down, Alexis not only sympathised, but also was outraged that no one had helped Karen. The woman had lost her memory and found herself on the sidelines of life. After thinking a little, Alexis suggested, Stay with us. We have enough room, and the children, as I understand it, are happy to have you. Are you sure about that? Karen asked cautiously. I'm truly grateful to you, so I ask that you continue to look after the children. Alexis stood her ground. I work shifts as a hospital orderly, and unfortunately, my children are often left alone. Okay, I understand you, and I agree, especially since I have nowhere else to go, replied Karen. Karen's face lit up with a happy smile that she could now live in humane conditions and no longer waste time searching for food. After agreeing on what to do and when, Alexis continued to work calmly at the hospital. Dr. Whitaker still made attempts to court her, but Alexis did not want anything to do with him, so she avoided him if she could. Once, Julia asked Alexis, So how's your homeless woman doing? Has she stolen anything else from the apartment? Oh my God, where do you get these thoughts? Alexis responded annoyed. We're getting along just fine. I've never met anyone before who could help like that. Nothing surprising. There are such people everywhere. Julia shrugged. Well, name one person who helped you, Alexis suggested. Julia hesitated with her response. See? And it's unlikely that anyone will do it unless there's a direct benefit in it, Alexis said. You know, my friend, you're right, Julia agreed, and I apologize for kidding at you about that beggar. Her name is Karen, and she's also like a mother to me, Alexis corrected her. And let's not discuss this poor woman's life anymore. Life has already dropped her to the bottom. Let's not gossip about her anymore. Okay, okay. I'll keep quiet. Excellent. Let's get to work, said Alexis, and patted Julia on the shoulder. And they went to do their duties. This conversation was the last one about Karen in this way. Julia no longer tried to pick on Karen. On the contrary, she became interested in Karen's health and what she was doing. It seemed that Alexis's colleague also sympathized with her, especially since Alexis told her that Karen had lost her memory. Julia even passed things through Alexis to her guest. Julia's mother had passed away six months ago, leaving behind a lot of clothing. Julia didn't dare to throw it away, but this was a chance to find a use for it. Karen thanked Julia and invited her for a cup of tea and pie. No matter what, the elderly woman knew how to cook deliciously, though she didn't remember where she got such abilities from. Three weeks had passed since Karen appeared in Alexis's apartment. 
During this time, Karen had fully adapted to normal life. The children had also become accustomed to her, and, strangely enough, called her grandma. They thought she had gone away for some time, and had returned. Moreover, Alexis didn't think of dispelling their assumptions. They lived like one big family. Meanwhile, Alexis couldn't get Karen's memory loss out of her head. It was unbelievable that she didn't have any relatives. Someone had to be looking for this woman. However, Alexis didn't know who or where exactly, but she hoped to receive information soon. She addressed to volunteers with a request to search for Karen's relatives. She briefly told them what had happened and provided photos from her phone. When she took pictures of Karen, the volunteers promised to help. The volunteers started the search and kept in touch with Alexis. However, there wasn't much to share. In the places where the homeless usually went, no one knew Karen. They showed her photos, but homeless people only repeated the same phrase, We don't know anything. It was surprising that Karen spent so much time among them, and they didn't remember her. Or maybe they just didn't want to get involved, afraid that they would be taken in to the police as many of them already had problems with the law. For example, the lack of documents. The homeless did not care about this fact, but the law enforcement officers could be seriously interested in it, and that's why the homeless didn't want to be in contact. At the same time, the search continued, and the volunteers promised to do everything possible. Meanwhile, Alexis herself tried to find her, using social networks and other internet resources. Karen watched her actions and just lamented. I don't think anything will come out of this. If I had loving relatives, they would have somehow shown up with their searches. I'll still try to look for her if you don't mind, Alexis continued. Of course, I'm all for it, but I'm sorry to disturb you, Karen said guiltily. Get rid of all these gloomy thoughts commanded Alexis. You don't disturb anyone. Just look how the guys became cheerful when you appeared. It's just a fairy tale, not reality. Alexis continued the search, which soon became known at work. While Julia supported her, all the other employees joked, and some even made gestures at their temples saying, You're just going crazy helping some beggar. She's just an ordinary woman, just with life difficulties. Alexis tried to convince them. You don't understand anything about it. So don't judge, and you won't be judged. In general, almost everyone in the team, except for Julia, believed that Karen was just fooling her and tried to dissuade Alexis from further searches and to send Karen to the shelter. But Alexis was not the kind of person to stop at difficulties. She believed that she could find Karen's relatives. At the same time, Dr. Whitaker's advances drove Alexis to a nervous breakdown. She didn't have time for love games, but he just wouldn't let up. So one day she responded to him rudely. Why don't you go far away and for a long time? I already have a bunch of problems and you're still bothering me. What's wrong with you? You have a wife, so go bother her. And as for the beggar, as you called her once, she's just as human as anyone else, including you. And her problems are my problems. I'll show you. The doctor snarled and tried to grab her. At that moment, employees began to gather in the corridor, drawn by the noise. They decided to find out what was going on and was surprised to witness a scene of a quarrel between the doctor and orderly. What? Are you all here? Don't you have work to do? Dr. Whitaker shouted at them. You should shout louder so the patients can hear you, Alexis replied sarcastically. Anyway, you're not working here anymore, Dr. Whitaker summed up. I'm firing you. Pack up and get out. Fine, as you want. The employees were left tongue-tied with surprise and began to whisper to each other. They hadn't expected this culmination. Everyone had hoped that the head doctor would calm down and the conflict would be resolved peacefully, but no, 
he went all in and fired Alexis. She received her payment and left the hospital. Before saying goodbye, she visited Julia, who was shocked when she found out what happened. She had been in another building at the time. I just can't believe he did that, she said. It's okay, I'll make it through, Alexis reassured her. I'll find another job. Maybe try some private clinics. Don't worry, I won't disappear. I've been through worse. Life doesn't stand still. You're an optimist, Julia said in surprise. Sometimes I am amazed by myself too, Alexis smiled. Not so long ago, when Lawrence died, I didn't even know how to go on living. It seemed to me that the whole world had turned dark, and the earth had turned upside down. You can't imagine what it's like to be left alone with three children in your arms. But it's okay. The main thing is not to lose heart. Alexis winked and left the hospital building. She was no longer attached to this place. Of course it was a shame that her work experience was interrupted. On the other hand, Alexis had a whole pile of problems that needed urgent attention. Recently, volunteers had informed her that they had found a lead. They gave Alexis the address of the alleged Karen's son. However, Tyler lived a hundred kilometers away in a neighboring city. Alexis wondered why he had not been able to find his mother. Well, we don't know. We just happened to run into him. The thing is, we also collaborate with animal shelters, the volunteer explained. So Tyler came there to ask what to do with his cat. She missed her owner and didn't give anyone any peace. I don't understand. What does the cat have to do with it? Alexis asked. The cat belonged to Karen, Alexander continued. At the shelter, Tyler shared his troubles with one of the employees. That's how we realized that he was Karen's son. Here's Tyler's address. Go and tell him the good news. We didn't do it ourselves. We thought you'd give him a surprise. That will be a surprise indeed, Alexis agreed. Thank you. I owe you. We were interested in participating in the search ourselves, the volunteer shrugged. Alexis took the piece of paper with Karen's son's address. She didn't tell anyone yet. She needed to be sure that he was truly her son. After knowing about the shelter and the cat, Alexis suspected that Tyler might have gotten rid of his mother himself. If he probably wanted to get rid of a cat, it would not be difficult for him to send a person to the other world. Regardless, there was no point in guessing. Alexis went to meet Tyler, but before that, she instructed Karen, Don't spoil them with sweets too much, or they'll get used to it. And are you leaving for long? Karen cautiously asked Alexis. I think just today, well, maybe two, no more. Alexis replied thoughtfully. Karen came out to bid farewell, their mother, and hugged her. Smiling back at them, she kissed each one. Alexis headed to the station to catch the first train to the neighboring city, and soon arrived at the address. It was a three-story house that looked like a palace. Alexis had never seen such beauty before. Shivering as if it were cold outside, Alexis approached the door and rang the bell. After a few minutes, footsteps were heard and a man, in his thirties, appeared on the doorstep. He looked at Alexis, then nodded his head, as if to ask who she was and what she wanted. For a few seconds, Alexis was at a loss, but then she took out some photos from her bag. The homeowner was shocked when he saw the picture. Where did you get this? And where is my mother? His hands were shaking. She's fine. She's with me, Alexis replied. But I'm interested in how Karen ended up in another city. We'll talk inside. Tyler invited her in. Alexis went inside and was even more surprised. The beauty outside was just the tip of the iceberg. The real luxury was in the interior of the house. There were antique furnitures and paintings, marble tiles on the floor. Noticing the guest's confusion, he cautiously said, This is all that's left of my father. He was an antique dealer. 
I see, Alexis nodded. And I thought you were the one who bought it all. No, I'm just an ordinary middle-class businessman. He waved his hand. My father did what he liked while I was doing in business. All of this is impressive, of course. Alexis changed the subject. But I just can't understand how your mother disappeared. It happened half a year ago. Tyler began his story. I bought my mum a ticket to the sea. She had wanted to go there for a long time, but soon after she left, she disappeared. The phone was silent, and I didn't know what to do. Did you try to find her? Alexis asked. Of course. I travelled all over the city, but with no result. Tyler nodded. It's strange that with your resources you couldn't find your mother, Alexis said thoughtfully. Don't be fooled by the luxury, Tyler repeated. I understand, Alexis nodded. Get ready, we'll go to your mother's place. Maybe she'll remember something. Oh? What's wrong with her memory? Tyler asked with horror. I don't know, maybe she has amnesia after the hit. Alexis shrugged. Oh my god. After hit? Only stop talking. We're, we're going to her just right now, but I need one more minute to call Chloe and let her know I'm going out, Tyler said, getting ready. Chloe? Who's she? If it's not a secret, Alexis asked. Well, she's kind of my fiancé, Tyler answered uncertainly. Why kind of? Alexis asked. You see, we still can't get married, Tyler replied with frustration. First, my mother disappeared, then other problems. So I decided that there will be no wedding until my mother is found. You could have married by now, especially since so much time has passed, Alexis said. Let's not talk about my fiancé now. What's important to me right now is to see my mum, Tyler said. An hour later, they arrived at Alexis's hometown. As they approached her apartment, Alexis asked quietly, Are you ready? Yes, Tyler replied, and Alexis opened the door. A few seconds later, Karen appeared in the corridor. Upon seeing her, Tyler shouted through the apartment, Mum, you're alive! Alexis, is this my son? Karen asked, confused, and started crying. Yes, it's him, Alexis replied. It can't be. My dear son, I don't believe it. Karen continued to cry. It's me, Mum, Tyler, your own son. He reached out his arms, trying to hug her. Karen didn't push him away and hugged him too. Alexis expected the meeting to be more modest, considering that her guest had memory problems. However... Everything turned out differently. Karen burst into tears, recognising her son, and at the same moment loudly said, Exactly. I remembered. It's your fiancé who's guilty. I don't understand in what sense, Tyler asked with undisguised surprise. Wait, wait, I don't feel well. Karen waved her hands and began to lean on Tyler and Alexis. After catching her breath, Karen looked at everyone with tearful eyes and said, It was a mistake, son, getting involved with her. I knew something bad would happen. The stress from meeting her son affected Karen, and she gradually began to remember events from that misfortunate day. It turned out that Karen really was going to the sea. She wanted to relax on the warm sand and tan under the southern sun. Tyler bought her a ticket and booked a good hotel, just a couple of minutes' walk from the sea. He thought he was giving his mother a gift. However, the cause of all her problems was Tyler's fiance. It was she who incited her acquaintances to get rid of Karen. However, they not only hit her on the head from the back, it was she who incited her acquaintances to get rid of Karen. However... They not only hit her on the head from the back, but managed to mention Chloe. Leave Chloe alone. Don't interfere with her and Tyler, Karen said. Are you serious? Tyler asked in horror. Yes, as strange as it sounds, 
but your Chloe wanted to kill me, Karen nodded. The elderly woman went on to talk about how she was originally against their relationship. Karen saw through Chloe, and that's why she insisted that they sign a prenuptial agreement. Tyler was sceptical at the time about the usefulness of such formalities, but his mother convinced him that it would be better, and in the end he agreed. But the bride categorically refused, and then his mother went to the sea and disappeared. I knew your relationship wouldn't end well, the mother ended her story. I'm sorry, Mum, for God's sake, Tyler cried. I was blind, like a kitten. I didn't notice anything around me. Later, Tyler called his friends and asked them to shake out from his ex fiance all the information about the attempted murder of his mother. Under their pressure, she confessed everything and gave up her accomplices. They were soon arrested, and during the investigation, they confessed that everything was planned by Chloe. It was she who persuaded them to keep an eye on Karen at the nearest station and kill her. When Karen got off at the station to have a fresh evening air, they chose the moment, hit her, but someone scared them away. In general, they threw Karen's body into a ditch, took her documents, money, and ran away. Thus, they covered their tracks, so that if anything happened, the case would be investigated in another city. However, they informed Chloe that the job was done and received money from her. Tyler was shocked when he learned about everything. Karen soon regained her memory completely and was able to find out that her son had been hoping and waiting all this time. So, half a year has passed. Tyler started a relationship with Alexis, especially since his mother approved, and soon he proposed to her. The woman was over the moon with happiness. She burst into tears and said, In sorrow and in joy, until the end of our days, I agree to become your wife. Even the pigeons took flight and circled over them at the sound of her voice. It was a good sign that indicated two loving hearts had found each other. The Alexis's children and Karen watched from the sidelines. Karen became the children's real grandmother. She approached Alexis and Tyler and blessed their marriage. A month later, they got married and Alexis and the children began to prepare to move into Tyler's house. But in her hometown, Alexis had a debt to pay. Tyler was surprised when Alexis asked him to take her to the hospital where she had been fired. Alexis easily found Dr. Whitaker, who was making his rounds among the patients. Without hesitation, she began to tell him everything she thought of him and what he deserved. To his misfortune, his wife was at the hospital this time. She heard everything. What happened after that cannot be put into words. Poor Dr. Whitaker searched for a place to hide from his enraged wife, but still got an earful from her. It's a good thing he survived. After such a quarrel, he suddenly lost all desire to flirt on the side. Finally, all the business was finished, and Alexis and her children left the city for their new life.